Hey everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, Dan Rochester. I manage the field services division for TNT. I um, also do a lot of business analysis and sort of special projects and kind of things like that. So I'm hoping that um, as I go through here, you'll start to see kind of the connections between those. Um, services is actually not necessarily the first consideration when you're looking at putting in one of these systems. Um, it's usually about the bottom line, capital expenditures, but uh, um, they're definitely not low maintenance machines, so it's really important to make sure that you have a contractor who has the sort of ability and capacity to, to take care of, of uh, your installation. Um, just to give you a little overview of sort of our service operations and what we can do, um, we currently service around 5,000, a bit higher, uh, engine generators in Canada. Uh, we cover all of Eastern Canada, um, as well as uh, Saskatchewan and parts of Manitoba and Alberta. Um, we pretty much do it all in terms of uh, power generation. So uh, diesel for uh, primarily standby uh, generator applications, um, propane and natural gas, uh, where those are available, and particularly on um, CHP cogeneration, continuous operation uh, setups. Um, but I mean, we do all makes, models, and ages, sizes, configurations, pretty much anything you can think of. So while we uh, we do uh, have you know strong support for the products that we sell, we um, we service just about anything. So I mean, if you've got a standby generator that you need us to look after, you can talk to me about that as well. Um, um, more of a focus of uh, today is sort of the continuous duty uh, cogeneration systems, um, and again, we do it all from plain routine maintenance all the way to um, more complicated uh, diagno diagnostics, uh, repairs, troubleshooting, and of course we um, do setups, startups, commissioning for everything we sell. Uh, and almost the most important thing, uh, probably the 24-7, 365 emergency response. Um, so we pretty much covered that entire Eastern Canada region as well as Saskatchewan um, with uh, you know prompt emergency response all hours of the day and night. Um, we started as a service company, so it's really kind of in our in our DNA. Um, we uh, believe that it adds tremendous value to our sales offerings. Um, and as you can see from the graph there, 60% of our workforce is still service. I mean, we have grown uh, quite a bit since the early days, um, so we have uh, significant sales, production, IT, construction maintenance, accounting, software development, um, all kinds of other staff, but 60% of our workforce is still in service. Uh, six service locations across Canada and um, 20 technicians in Ontario alone uh, available for service. Um, again, like I mentioned, it uh, really comes down to having reliable support for the, um, for the products that we sell. Um, particularly uh, the Siemens reciprocating internal combustion engine products. Um, we found that Siemens values sort of the after sale support side just as much as we do. Um, so I think that's sort of what makes it a great partnership between us and Siemens. Um, they definitely recognize that as one of our uh, one of our values, and we likewise recognize that in them. Um, so it drives a very uh, productive partnership. Um, just a quick rundown of some of our qualifications. We were uh, proud to win the Canadian Business Excellence Award for private business uh, very recently. Um, uh, we're I, our service partners ISO 9001 and 14001 certified for quality management and environmental management. Um, you know, we are uh, certified by Contractor Check and ComplyWorks, um, so basically health and safety uh, compliance organizations. Um, and on the technical side, um, we kind of employ uh, a vast array of people from multiple backgrounds. So we have uh, diesel mechanics, heavy equipment mechanics, gas fitters, plumbers, oil burner technicians, electricians, and I could probably go on. Um, we have an extensive in-house training program, and we also do a lot of factory training. So um, a number of our technicians have been to the, the plant that Tyler mentioned earlier uh, in Spain to do some training on the, on the Siemens products. Uh, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about what I'm gonna call our platform advantage. And I guess the basic premise here is that, um, you know, while we are a service contractor and we send technicians out to sites and they turn wrenches and do all those, all those things, um, you're actually getting much more uh, for your for your dollar when when we're your contractor. You're basically plugging yourself into sort of the TNT platform 
Um, and that's centered around innovation, digitalization, and uh, customization. So I'll go through this um, and give you a few examples as well of the kind of things we're doing. So the things we focus on are process efficiency, um, basically maximizing the talents of, of the, the people we have on staff, um, adding value to our service offerings. So if we can give you sort of a web tool or, or some sort of um, technological advantage uh, in addition to sort of the nuts and bolts service you're getting, um, that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to give both our customers as well as our employees uh, better and quicker access to information. Um, we're looking to customize the process so if there's something that you as a customer specifically need in terms of your reporting or in terms of a web dashboard or something like that, um, that's the kind of thing that we can build. Uh, we also integrate all these systems together. So uh, our work reporting and our web portals and everything are all integrated, even things like remote monitoring, fluid sampling, all these kind of things. So we, we have um, sort of in-house uh, IT and software development and that's that's a, a priority for us because it allows us to really uh, capitalize on these sort of value adds to our service offering um, and makes us uh, far more flexible in terms of giving our customers exactly what they need. Uh, so I'm gonna go through just a few examples of the kind of things we do. Remote monitoring I mentioned, um, it's particularly valuable on sort of continuous, uh, continuously operating power generation systems. Um, these systems are, are um, maintained based on running hours. So every 2,000 running hours, say, we need to change the oil and filters, um, and so on. So having remote monitoring really gives us visibility into you know when those kind of things need to happen. Um, we get notification for alarms, false shutdowns. Um, so basically that 24-7, 365 emergency service really kicks in there. Um, it's integrated with other systems, so it's integrated with our sort of on-call systems uh, and those kind of things to um, to really sort of guarantee sort of that quick response in case of an emergency. Um, we also use it for inventory management. So for a larger product pro project, we would um, stock parts on site as well as uh, having our own offsite stock. And we're able to track this and maintain it um, through technology. Same goes for you know consumables, oil, coolant, and things like that that uh, they need to you know maintain stock on. Um, Dashboards is a, a really cool sort of thing we've done for some of our customers. Across the top there, um, I have an example of, of what appears on one of our dashboards for one of our larger customers. Um, this is a customer that has a lot of smaller generator sets, standby units, that are over a, a very wide geographic spread. So it's a much different operation than managing a large machine or a few large machines in one location. Um, and since they are standby units, you know, we see them maybe once or twice a year. This gives them sort of immediate insight into what our progress for the year is. This is all purpose built for them. Um, so we can, we can pull any sort of data that, that, we, that we record, that our technicians are recording when they're on site, and build a customized dashboard. So things like, how often do we need to refuel this site? How many batteries did we change this year? You know, whatever is really important to the customer in terms of their bottom line and their planning process and life cycle management. Um, again, it integrates with our work reports and all of our systems, and it's all in real time. So if I'm a technician on the road and I fill up my work report and submit it, this is sort of immediately updated. So our customers are getting a real time look into sort of the status of, of their uh, program. Um, I talked about work reporting a little bit. Um, we have it available through our web portal. Um, technicians can do it on their phone, and it's all kind of laid out. This is on the right. It's just sort of an example of the kind of report we would we would fill out. Um, it gives us really detailed equipment history, um, and you know it's all consolidated, filterable, searchable, so we can really dig down um, and sort of so often we can sort of identify problems before they get too serious. I think the main thing here is that we make this available to on-site maintenance staff. So if you have staff that are supposed to do a generator check once a day or once a week or whatever, we can give them a login to the website. So rather than having paper logs and carbon copies and all of this sort of old-fashioned type, um, type paperwork, they're able to log into our site, fill out their weekly or daily report or whatever it may be, on our site and submit it. And that goes into the unit history. So again, it's all consolidated. Um, and I guess another advantage of that is um, 
you know, you can kind of keep an eye on your maintenance staff and make sure they're doing their job. If, uh, if we get an alert saying, hey, a weekly test hasn't been done in six weeks, you know, you're going you're gonna to find out about it. Whereas if you're, you know, filling out paper copies or a, or a paper logbook, you might not necessarily have visibility into, into those kinds of things. So, um, another example is some mapping tools that we've come up with. So this one on the left is a, uh, a tool we developed for that same customer. You can see it's a very large geographic spread. Um, and this sort of gives them another way to visualize that data. So we have it all sort of color coded with various icons that tell them sort of which, uh, which sites have been completed, which ones are still outstanding, whether there are any outstanding deficiencies, um, and things like that. And again, all updated in real time. Uh, we also use these internally, um, so it really helps with our scheduling, routing, labor forecasting, that type of thing. On the right, I think that's an example of um, one of our other customers around the Hamilton area um, and all of their um, their equipment. It's color coded by month, so this is the month of the year that we would visit that site. Um, so that's uh, hopefully gives you a pretty good idea of the way we can sort of customize, leverage technology, uh, and sort of build tools that really uh, meet our customers' needs specifically. Um, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about our uh, our service offering. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to speak with me after, or uh, I'll give you a card and we can we can correspond. Um, I would like to just kind of bring this all full circle a little bit and um, go through a little bit of a case study. So, come on, I've come up with sort of a, an imaginary uh, greenhouse operation, um, and I'd like to just kind of go through it and sort of talk about what the different considerations are going to be for. Um, capital expenditures, ongoing operational expenses. Um, I think like uh, both uh, John and Rob said, um, regardless of which way you're coming at this, if you're trying to mitigate peaks, um, or if you're just gonna run all the time, uh, a CHP unit is really um, an excellent solution for that. Um, and I think as we go through this, we'll hopefully see, um, see how that works out. Um, so we made some assumptions. I'm going to go with a five-acre facility with 12 feet high. So that may be small by some standards, um, but it makes the, the math easy. Um, we'll start out with current sort of market pipeline natural gas prices. So that's sort of what you would get paying union gas. Again, this is a parameter that you can sort of play with um, and see, you know, uh, where, where that comes out. Um, I'll look at hopefully some hydro pricing with various degrees of GA mitigation. So from absolutely no mitigation at maybe 14 cents a kilowatt hour, um, all the way down to full mitigation, someone who's hitting all five global adjustment peaks and is maybe paying four or five cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, the other thing that we'll have to consider is whether there's uh, sort of existing CO2 heat and electricity infrastructure in a facility or if we're building something new, obviously. If you're building something new, you are going to take into account sort of capital costs of those alternative methods. Um, whereas if you are um, sort of retrofitting an existing operation, um, those are already kind of sunk capital costs. So um, we'll assume a one megawatt power requirement and five million BTUs an hour of heat. So over here, I have some caveats listed, and I mean the main, the thrust of of this part is really that every situation is unique. So some of these assumptions might uh, might not be exactly um, you know what you see from day to day. Um, really, a full evaluation of your project and your situation is required for us to really dig deeply into this. Um, so what I'm going to get to is um, basically an ROI calculator tool that'll help you sort of um, determine what sort of return on investment you would get with one of these systems. Um, it'll allow you to plug in a number of different parameters. I'll kind of go through those quickly here. So on electricity, um, there's really negligible capital costs in most cases um, uh, for just sort of a standard grid setup, although we heard um, from some people today that in some cases those can be quite high. I've sort of assumed that they're um, negligible in this case. Um, and your operational costs are basically the cost that you're paying for hydro. That's about it. Um, on the co-generation side, you have to pay for the machine. You have building permits, uh, electrical and controls connections, and then 
you know, civil, mechanical work, um, things like that to sort of set up the plant. And of course you have to maintain these machines and supply them with natural gas. And that's more or less a uh, breakdown of your operating cost. When it comes to heat, um, the alternative is basically, you know, a standard boiler system plus all your piping and pumping. That would be sort of your capital cost considerations and you need natural gas to run a boiler. Um, on the cogen side, really, you just need a couple of extra components that allow you to capture the heat from the water jacket and capture the heat from the exhaust system. Um, and again, you need that piping and pumping, but that is going to be very similar to the infrastructure you need uh, just using sort of a standard boiler. Um, and on the cogeneration side, there's virtually zero maintenance involved uh, in terms of the additional equipment required to use the, the heat. Uh, on the CO2 side, the alternatives, you know, there's a few options uh, that uh, Laura and yours talked about. So CO2 burners or generators are fairly common, um, or tank systems. Um, some people, uh, you know, capture the exhaust from uh, from a boiler. So those are different uh, possibilities there. And your operational expenses, again, depend on how you're doing that. So if you're using a tank, you're going to have to obviously refill that tank over and over. You're going to have general maintenance, and if you're using a burner or a generator, you're going to have to um, supply gas to that. Um, on the cogeneration side, we kind of went over this. Um, you have your SCR. Now, you will already need an SCR if you're running the lean burn unit, which is sort of the, the standard for uh, continuous operation. But there is a price difference when you're talking about a SCR that, uh, that, will, that will supplement uh, your facility with CO2. So you'd have to consider you know, how much more you're gonna have to pay for that. Um, and then whatever sort of dispersion system you need. But again, that is covered in the alternative as well. And either way, you're gonna have to disperse this stuff into the air. Uh, operational expenses are just sort of your annual SCR maintenance as well as the urea, um, again, that, uh, that Lauren uh, talked about. Um, so basically, um, We've sort of created this ROI calculator, and uh, it takes into account all of these costs. You can sort of plug them in, and again, your mileage may vary, so whatever your numbers are may not be exactly what we have put in here, but um, we'll happily you know, give you access to this tool so you can play around with it. You can see what sort of um, ROI you might get on your system. Again, you guys, um, you guys are the experts, so if you're running a facility, you know you kind of understand the needs of your facility better than better than we do. Um, this really uh, sort of speaks to our collaborative approach, how we really like to sort of share information, and collaborate with people. So, um, I mean, we're really excited about the prospect of maybe talking to some people here about um, about sort of what the needs of your facility are, so we can sort of refine what we're doing here. Um, so I. I guess if Tyler can just pull up that tool really quickly, I'll, uh, I'll kind of show you what uh, what that looks like. Um, basically, um, you know, you can input your natural gas cost. So I put in 17 cents per cubic meter. That's um, probably seems insanely high to some people here, um, but uh, that's sort of you know what you'd expect to pay at your house maybe if you're. Uh, um, just with you know union gas or whatever. Um, now here you know basically a lot of the things I talked about. So your <coughs> capital cost for boilers input there, your operating expenses based on your boiler efficiency, um, and then these things for uh, cogen. So how much are you going to pay for extra equipment to uh, capture the heat? Um, how much are you going to pay in maintenance a year? And some other parameters. So how much heat can this um, cogen unit actually capture and use. And I sort of have similar analyses for uh, power. So if you look at your uh, sort of standard grid connection, your operating cost is basically basically your hydro cost. I have 12 cents in here now. Um, and then your cogen, you're going to have all of your capital costs of the machine as well as all of the sort of assorted items that go with that. And then your maintenance cost, which is typically uh, priced per running hour. So for every hour you run uh, the machine, it's going to cost you, in this case, $18 in maintenance, with it, which is sort of a, a ballpark figure of what the average one megawatt type unit uh, would take. 
Um, again, some parameters. So how much fuel does the unit use? Um, what is your sort of average load? Uh, and how many weeks, or how many hours per week would you expect to run this? Um, I put 160 in there, that's all. Things like that. Um, and finally, the CO2. This is where it gets a little dicey because you know you could be getting CO2 off your boiler, from burners, from tanks. I've sort of assumed that you're getting it from a boiler. There's some capital expenditure required for um, the for capturing that CO2 from the exhaust, and then you know some operational expense as well for that uh, exhaust capture. And then, of course, the alternative is you know the pr the price difference in SCR for CO2, as well as you know your urea costs per year, and again, that's a difference in urea costs. There's going to be some urea use on a standard SCR. Um, it's going to be a bit higher on a on this here designed for CO2. So that's not going to be your full urea price, but it's going to be um, the, the the difference in, in what you pay on a CO2 SCR, and then some number for SCR maintenance annually. Um, again, there's some parameters here about you know what, what's your ambient CO2 and how much CO2 do you want? What's your building size? How often does your air exchange? How many hours per day are you actually you know uh, supplementing CO2? And then sort of your urea consumption numbers and how much you're actually paying for the diesel exhaust fluid or whatever you know the, the uh, urea solution. Um, and at the end of the day. We basically get a global summary that gives us sort of our total capital expenditures for both situations, um, operational expenditures per year for both situations, and then um, basically what you're saving. So in this scenario, you know, you're looking at 1.3 million more in additional capital or initial capital expenditures, but you know you're saving yourself uh, quite a bit of money per year. So it pays itself off in less than two years. Um, now that's assuming a fairly high hydro price, um, no GE mitigation, I should say. Um, but, I mean, even if we do mitigate GA a little bit, we can change the operating expense for you know, our average hydro cost to you know, eight cents. Let's say we're mitigating, but we missed two peaks this year, and uh, we're looking at about eight cents. So if you make that change, we still have a, a fairly good payback. Let's say we go even to six cents. So we've missed a single peak. We still have a payback of just under eight years. So you can see that really um, these systems, in the vast majority of cases, pay for themselves. Um, again, please do take the time to contact us and have us go through this with you and use some of your numbers because that will really give you sort of the, the, the best idea of how this could work for you. Um, but um, that's sort of, that's uh, sort of this, uh, this cool little, uh, little tool we built. Um, and again, just another example of sort of the way we can leverage technology and give you sort of uh, interesting tools uh, and things like that to um, to, to really uh, help you in your decision making. Uh, and that's uh, about it for me. That's